time is 9.32. We're going to call the meeting to order. We'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance to the Flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Excuse me a second. Uh, next item on the agenda, public comment on agenda items other than development or rezoning applications. Do we have any public comment? Being none, move on to the next one. Number four, approval of the minutes from our last meeting of March the 22nd. Any additions or corrections? I move right. approval of the minutes. I hear a second on that? I'll second. Okay, Mr. McGrath, how do yes. you vote? Mr. Morgan? I vote yes. And I vote yes. Approval of the bills, item number five on the agenda. Any questions, comments? I'll move we pay the bills. Okay, do I hear a second on that? I'll second. Okay, Mr. McGrath, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Morgan, how do you vote? I vote yes. And I vote yes. Item number six is a public hearing on a petition requesting a change in zoning classification. This is by the Humane Society of Northwest PA by Nicole Baywall for property at 2433 Zimmerly Road, now zoned R1 single family residence in RR Rural Residential District, asking for a change in classification to C1 Local Commercial District. Uh, we'll start off with Mr. Pierce. Any comments from the Planning Commission or from the County? Uh, the Planning Commission recommended approval and Erie County uh, just pointed out that it was consistent with our future land use map and the County okay. use map. Okay, anybody to speak on behalf of this application? Okay, would you, if you would come up and identify yourself for the record. Good morning, my name is Nicole Baywall. I'm the Executive Director of the Humane Society located at 2407 Zimmerly Road. Okay. Um, as mentioned, we are looking for a rezone. We currently own 2407 Zimmerly, mm -hmm. and we purchased uh, 2433 about two years ago, which is an R1, and we are looking to have it rezoned as a C1 for commercial use for a pet, pet wellness clinic. Okay. Okay. Uh, any questions from the board? Anybody? Any questions or comments? And Chuck, you mentioned that that's consistent with our 90s plan. That's correct. Okay. okay. And of course, that use that you're asking for, that is one of the permitted uses in that district. Yeah. There are, I think, believe 19 uses That's correct. that are allowed in the yes. C1 zoning district, and that encompasses one of those, or at least in a, in a general area of that there. So, okay, any other public comments regarding this, either in opposition or in support? Being none, okay, nothing from anybody there? Hey, Chuck, at the Planning Commission, were there any concerns expressed by the public? No, sir. Okay, okay. I think we're all set. Do I hear a motion? I'll move approval of the rezoning request. Okay, do I hear a second on that? I'll second. Okay. Mr. McGrath? Yes. Mr. Morgan? I vote yes. And I vote yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. the property's rezoned. I would like just to make one comment for the record here, Ms. Baywall. Any work that's going to be done, you need to get that building brought up to building code for the commercial use of that. I just want to make sure you, you were aware of that. I'm, I'm sure you are. I just want to make sure of that. So. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next item, uh, item number seven, announcement of bids and quotations received. Brian, you start off. Uh, first is for a tree behind 803 Marshall Drive. This is actually uh, by the uh, Calvary Cemetery on, yeah. on Westlake Road. Uh, there was a, uh, a problem with a storm sewer easement and the tree uh, was in the way. This, the uh, quotes that we received were from Dibble Tree Service for $2,000. J. Thomas Tree Service was $6,870. And Jefferson Tree Service did not submit a quote. Um, I would move that Dibble Tree Service be awarded that contract. OK. Do I hear a second on that? I'll second. OK. Mr. McGrath, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Morgan? I vote yes. And I vote yes. And also on uh, tree trimming, uh, this is for 54th Street between Mill and Washington. The Streets Department is going to be doing some uh, significant uh, road repair in that area this year. And in order to get the equipment in, some several trees need to be trimmed. Uh, Dibble, Dibble Tree Service submitted a quote of $1,900. J. Thomas, $3,870. And Jefferson Tree, Tree Service, $2,375. It is uh, Gary Walter's recommendation, and I will move that Dibble Tree Service uh, be awarded that contract. Okay, do I hear a second on that? Uh, Mr. McGrath, the, yes. uh, the, I know we, we 
talk about briefly the tree trimming and removal of West 54th. Do we uh, know if we're actually removing trees? Or no. Primarily um, the plan is not to remove any trees. Uh, Gary Walters uh, let me know that when we did this uh, maybe a year or two ago on West 23rd Street, that uh, one of the trees was trimmed to a point where the uh, neighbor, the property owner who fronted, uh, actually requested that the tree be removed and then we planted a new tree in replacement um, or offered that and uh, that would be the same to hold true on uh, 54th Street if a tree needs to be, we hope not, but if a tree needs to be trimmed to such a point where it just doesn't look right anymore, right. we would remove that tree. Okay. I'll, I'll second the motion. Okay. Mr. McGrath, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Morgan? I'll vote yes. And I vote yes. Okay. Let's see here on the... I have a quote here too. This is from uh, Matt Exley, our, our fire code official, an emergency management coordinator. Gentlemen, I respectfully re request that you approve the following uh, purchase of one Ryobi portable generator for use by the EMA and also the portable traffic control trailer that we are refurbishing at this time. It is a budgeted expense for this year. Uh, he has three quotes attached with this. Uh, he would like to have the, to propose purchasing the one from Home Depot at a cost of $599. This will allow us to have power uh, in outage situations and also to have power for the aero board on the trailer in disaster situations. So I make that in the form of a motion that is for the $599, $599 generator from Home Depot. I make that in the form of a motion. I'll second. Okay, Mr. McGrath, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Morgan. I vote yes. And I vote yes. Okay, that's all for that. Uh, item number eight, resolution 2016 R-10, the PennDOT application for County 8. I'll refer this over to Mark. This is uh, part of the PennDOT approval process for um, uh, liquid fuel funds allocated to the county. Uh, this is for help assistance with uh, road salt for the winter. And uh, that's the amount that's been allocated okay. to us, the 69,118. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any questions from the board? Anybody? No. Okay. I hear a motion to approve that resolution. So moved. I hear a second on that. I'll second. Okay. Mr. McGrath, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Morgan. I vote yes. And I vote yes. Item number nine, resolution 2016 R-11, a resolution <laughs> by the Board of Supervisors establishing regulations regarding governing receipt and administration and disbursements of funds and assets received from and by virtue of the termination of the Mill Creek Water Authority. Once again, Mark, I'll refer it over to you. Okay. Uh, the remaining assets and funds of the Mill Creek Township Water Authority as transferred by the authority pursuant to its agreement with the township shall be dedicated to and deposited solely in one or more accounts restricted for capital projects and shall not be deposited in or deemed assets of the township's general fund. No transfer of principal funds to the township general fund is permitted absent a written resolution adopted by the Board of Supervisors. The idea here is to restrict the use of the uh, Water Authority sale funds. Right. Yeah, as a background here, folks, this, uh, for those of you watching this or in the audience here, the, um, Back when the, the sale was being proposed, this was one of the conditions is that the, the proceeds from that sale would be earmarked into a special account and uh, it's not like a lockbox, but pretty much uh, they were very much restricted and uh, how that money is going to be spent in the future. So, uh, of course, Mark gave the, uh, the cliff note version of, the, of what it's all about mm -hmm. and I think that pretty much sums it up there with mm -hmm. item number one on that. Uh, any questions or comments from the board? Well, the one comment, <coughs> excuse me, that I would make that um, we discussed this with our solicitor and if there was any way that this Board of Supervisors would actually be able to uh, commit or restrict future Boards of Supervisors uh, as to how they um, were to spend the money, the proceeds from the sale of the Water Authority. Uh, that may be difficult because it may be 25 years from now and none of us will be here and, and uh, uh, it'd, be, it'd be tough to commit a future Board as to how they could utilize that, that money. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the best that we could hope for is that should that money uh, be desired to be used in, in uh, whether it's a capital project or, or some other use in the future, that those boards of supervisors at least let the public know how they are planning to do that and have a public hearing so that uh, 
uh, they have the public has a chance to comment on the use of that money. Yeah. I mean, after all, it, it is a sizable amount of money. It's $12 million cash right now, then a million dollars a year, plus interest for the next 10 years. Correct. Uh, so it is a sizable amount of money, and uh, of course, uh, responsibility is, is what's key here, and I think, in all of this. And we may need to make sure that, uh, even though we have the best of intentions, but like you said, Brian, future boards are making sure that this is money is not thrown away on, on stuff that uh, of no return to the taxpayers. We hope that it's not used for uh, just to balance the budget, we would hope that it would be used for, what's the term that you used, John, for a project that makes a difference? Uh, <laughs> a large project that would actually well, they, make a uh, difference. A significant in, impact. Ma major yeah. capital improvements. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, we would hope that future boards would, would look at it that way, that this is a significant amount of money, one that was uh, generated by the sale of an asset, and we would hope that it uh, uh, is used properly in the future. Yeah. Well, I, I would just add that you know we are looking at updating our municipal comprehensive plan this year. I, I believe that how these funds get prioritized should be tied to that plan, which we hope to be a very community-driven process that will be kicking off this summer. Um, we really would need to value this resource we have. So many communities, especially in our area, are struggling right now. Um, who are really relying on the charity of other government agencies, we've got a real opportunity here to make some impactful uh, changes, impactful projects in our community with these funds. And we, we need to make sure we, we take advantage of it and uh, don't fall into balancing the budget or, or putting it towards operating funds. So, <clears throat> Evan, you referred to this as an interim resolution that we would have something a little bit more specific in the future. Well, I said it, not, it's not, not my job to, to set policy. But this board has said that it was going to conduct a process involving the public mm -hmm. to arrive at standards for, for how this, these funds were going to be used. And there's no question the public needs to understand this is not typical that, that any township has this kind of money mm -hmm. because usually townships operate from general funds every year. Uh, so, so this is the kind of money that if, uh, if you're not prudent with it, uh, 20 years from now, people look around and say, what the heck did we do wrong? Yeah. Uh, Mr. McGrath said that a board cannot bind all future boards of supervisors, and I think that's pretty much the law, but the, the board in the end could enact an ordinance defining its approach to this, these funds, and any future board would have to change that by amending the ordinance, and that requires public notice and some public hearing at a, at a regular meeting of the board so that there's an open public process. So, yeah, I, I think this is an interim thing because funds are going to start being transferred. Yeah. And we needed something in place when, when money started getting transferred. And I think the board has it in mind to yeah. start working on a more permanent approach that will involve, involve public input and the public knowing more about what the supervisors are thinking. And I think, uh, just to reiterate what Evan said, the, the key point here is the openness, letting the public know uh, when we're doing something with this money. And uh, I think it makes it very simple there. And I think that's our, our duty to make sure that they know about it. Something needs to be changed. We want to hear from them on that, too. And Evan, <clears throat> then in this ordinance that you referenced, we could uh, spell out the process, go into specifics. I thought that would be the point of of doing an ordinance where you now have a formality in terms of how you want it to be held, how you want the funds to be administered, what appropriate uses would include, and the process by which the board should, should, should go in addressing expenditures from the funds. I mean, a, an a ordinance is a permanent thing, and it's a law that can be amended, but at least it can't be amended in secret, which I think is the best you can yeah. do. That's right. Okay. Have we discussed it enough there? <laughs> I'll move approval of okay. resolution 2016 R11. Okay. Do I hear a second on that? I will second. Okay. Mr. McGrath, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Morgan? I vote yes. And I vote yes. Okay. Item number 10 on the agenda, streetlight agreement. This was, uh, let's see here, John, I think you have on this one here. Uh, yes. We received uh, petitions uh, from a neighborhood over in Bell Valley. Uh, requesting a streetlight be installed at an intersection of uh, Norcross and Kohler Road. 
Uh, we did send our engineering department and our traffic unit out to take a look at the intersection. They, they did concur that um, some enhanced lighting would be beneficial to public safety. We did reach out to, Pen to Penelec to begin that process of installation of those lights. And in this case, when we have a street light that is of township priority for public safety and intersection, uh, we do take on the installation costs and the annual uh, op operating costs. Um, if this were a neighborhood, uh, the, we would assess the, the neighborhood for those costs. But in this case, the, the township will be taking on the cost for that installation. But we do have a quote from Penelac. It's uh, $418 for upfront installation of that uh, street light. Uh, the uh, operating cost is $9.19 per month for the next 10 years. Uh, we, we all have a copy of the agreement with Penelac, and I would move that we approve uh, this agreement. I'll second that. Okay. Mr. Morgan, how do you vote? I vote yes. Mr. McGrath? Yes. And I vote yes. Item number 11, once back to you, John. I'm sorry? I'm just confused as to whether that agreement relates to Norcross. It does? Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. I think it said it on there. there oh, I'm sorry. Well, there's an attached email, Evan. Yeah. On the second Here, page. Evan, so. you can have this. No, well, I see the attached email. Okay. I just thought it was two separate things. Yeah. No. Yeah, it, it's a general agreement that we signed for the contracts. Okay. Okay. Uh, the next item, uh, Mr. Chairman, is our uh, dis discussion of a neighbor installation on Filer Road that uh, I, I asked to have tabled from our last meeting. Uh, the issue at, at that time was whether or not we could install LED lights instead of high pressure sodium lights at that location, which from our initial investigations Pen with Penelec would have saved uh, the neighborhood about 30 percent in fees annually. We had some difficulty getting a meeting set up with Penelec to discuss some of the problems with that. The, the main issue we have is when an LED installation is requested, upfront costs uh, are charged. In this case, it's up to about $2,000 of upfront fees. Um, Gail Jairs, our uh, streetlight administrator, uh, did determine that it, Penelec actually charges upfront fees no matter what kind of light you put in. They just amortize the fees for high pressure sodium and require upfront costs for LED. And we've been trying to uh, contact Penelex if we can't negotiate having those costs built into the annual billing. Um, we, we've had difficulty getting that lined up. We do have a meeting next week. If the board would indulge me for one more week, I'd, I'd like to table this one more time to see if we can't get this problem resolved. I did talk to the gentleman who initiated the petition. Um, I know the neighborhood is, is very eager to get these installed, um, but that gentleman uh, understood we were trying to save the neighborhood some money over the long term, and he's being very patient with us, but I, I would ask me one more week to try and work this thing out. Um, and if we can't get that LED issue resolved, then uh, I'd be, uh, we should move forward uh, with the high pressure sodium. But I, I would move the table at one more time. So the issue, John, is does the neighborhood have to recirculate a petition? I think if we can demonstrate that we're going to save them 30 percent in fees, there's no reason to force them to have a, a recirculation of the petition. And, and, that, and I don't have a problem with that as long as the neighborhood is aware that, as long as they're aware ahead of time that it's going to be a different light, it's not. What, what I suggested to the, to the gentleman who initiated the petition was uh, perhaps sending a notice out to the neighbors, giving okay. them maybe 15 days to comment on it. Um, this is what we're thinking about doing. If you have an objection, let me know. Right. Okay. And his response to me was, well, geez, no, no one really cares what kind of light goes in there. They just want the lights. Okay. Right. And especially if it's going to save them a bunch of money. Right. And I, I know there was some concern at the last meeting about, about those lights and what the issues would be. Um, my understanding is LED lights is actually, uh, it's going to be the same level of lighting, but it's going to be a more focused lighting. It's more directional. Um, which I think would actually be less of an impact for the neighborhoods. And one of the concerns that was brought up last week was whether it be more light shining into homes or disrupting folks. Um, in my experience, working in transportation projects with LED lights, it's always a much more focused beam of light. It doesn't just disseminate as, as far. So I think it would actually be less of an impact for, for residents. It's just going to light basically your front yard, your sidewalk, and the streets. It's so primarily the, the road. Right. I'd like to make a comment about this. Uh, as many of you may know, I come from an electrical background as an electrician working in the trade for many years before I became an inspector. 
Uh, there is a, a difference between the HPS and the LED lights. And uh, if you were looking at this strictly from a contract standpoint, uh, with the residents being the customer, I think that they need to know that this is a change order, that there is a significant change on this. Um, and I want to make sure that the neighbors over there that signed this petition are aware and I'm just wondering if we'd be better off going through the petition again just to make sure that they know and if they have a question regarding the difference between HPS and LEDs then maybe get a hold of Penelec and maybe Penelec can show them you know, give them addresses to go to where there's an LED light put in and where there's an HPS put in. Well, so I think that that probably could be accomplished by the letter that John was talking about okay. that goes out and says yeah. A letter that says this is the the impact. Yeah. This is the right. difference between this yeah. type of lighting and that type yeah. of lighting. And um, if you have an objection to a right. change, to, okay. to let us know. Yeah. Uh, and, and I can understand the gentleman. I think there were 29 people on the original mm -hmm. uh, petition trying to get to everybody's house. You know, if they're not home, mm -hmm. then you have to go back again. Um, yeah. I can see where he would. Yeah. be hesitant to well, want to go through that process. Yeah. I, can, I guess it took about a year, in the, in the initial process took about a year. Well, and, and I would yeah. suggest that it, uh, I, I, I would assume that if the original petition is at LED instead of high pressure sodium, they the, same, the same folks would have signed the well, petition. Yes. But, but whatever it is, I mean, say, they was, need to know. say this was for our, on our property mm -hmm. here, we were doing this. That's a significant change and that would require a change order from the architect or engineer designing it. Uh, they have to bring it to us as the customer and saying, hey, this is the change that we need to make here going from HPS to LEDs. Uh, what are your thoughts on it? Are you so, okay with the change order? So we're not going to do it unless they agree. I, I, I'm just throwing that out there. I'm yeah. thinking I don't want to have the residents calling us and saying, hey, we thought we were getting HPS and why are these lights only so so focused on certain areas there? We thought we were getting HPS. Okay. So I'm not trying to belabor the matter. I'm just saying you know, this is something that can uh, be an issue for the neighbors who have thought they were going to get a bright light. Maybe they, do, maybe they don't want a bright light, maybe they do. So I'm okay as far as tabling it. John, you want to table it till next week? If you'll humor me, I'd, I'd like one more chance to try and okay. sort this out. You made a motion? Well, I, I move it? to table it. Okay. Uh, I'll second that. Okay. Mr. Morgan, how do you vote? I vote yes. Mr. McGrath? Yes. I vote yes. That'll be tabled until next week. Okay, next item, uh, nominate, item number 12, nominations for possible appointment to the Erie City Water Authority. Um, give me a second here. We, um, there are two open seats on the Erie City Water Authority. Uh, one was just through the completion of a term of office by Dr. Dreyfus. Uh, his, uh, he completed his term uh, in January, or at the beginning of, at the beginning of January. Uh, we'd like to nominate uh, some, put some names in for that. And there's also another seat that has been vacated early. Uh, it was held by uh, Mill Creek resident Bob McIsaac. So um, we have the, uh, the wish to give some names to Erie City Council for consideration to fill those two seats. And uh, so we have to go through just a, some sort of formality here to let those names be known to City Council. And we need to bring them up in public here. So. Uh, I would, uh, if you want me to start, I have a name, I would like to, or do you have something you want to I discuss Just about? a quick comment, um, yeah. when, well this has been going on for years, this is long before the, the most recent uh, sales agreement, um, asset sales agreement with the, uh, with the Erie City Water Authority um, in regard to selling Mill Creek System to the City Water Authority. This started years and years ago when, um, as far as I can remember, uh, when there was a vacancy on the Erie City Water Authority board, uh, Mill Creek would submit a name or two or maybe three um, to City Council or the Mayor's office for consideration for it to fill that vacancy. Um, sometimes a, a name from that list would be selected, sometimes it wouldn't. Um, we approached the city on more than one occasion to um, allow the new agreement to actually specify that the names that would be selected would be from the list that the Board of Supervisors submitted. Not even we're going to give you a name to fill a vacancy, it was we're going to give you two or three or four names that you can select from to fill that vacancy and that was rejected. That suggestion 
to have in the agreement was rejected. Um, whether it was city council or the mayor, they, they said, no, we like it the way it is. We're gonna pick um, who we wanna pick. And um, this is a case where we are going to submit some names. I believe it's gonna be three mm -hmm. to fill two vacancies. I would hope that um, those vacancies are filled by someone in this list of three that we are submitting. Um, I, I see no reason why if these representatives on the Erie City Water Authority are supposed to be representing uh, the residents of Mill Creek, now all the residents of Mill Creek, I see no reason why the Board of Mill Creek Supervisors shouldn't be granted that ability to, to uh, have someone selected from a list that we supply. Um, I understand that uh, um, City Council and the Mayor's Office um, has that right now and they'd like to hold on to it. I just think that it's the right thing to do to allow the Milk Creek Supervisors to provide a list and someone be selected from that list. Not somebody else who's outside that list, someone from the list that we provide. So we are going to uh, provide some names that they can choose from and I would hope that um, in this case I believe City Council will do the correct thing and select someone from that list. And I agree with that there too. Mr. Morgan, do you have any comments? No, I, I agree with Mr. McGrath. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see here. I'll start to my right. What name do you have that you'd like to submit? I would, I would like to submit Dean Swanson, who currently serves on our um, Milk Creek Township Water Authority, soon to be defunct Milk Creek Township Water Authority. But Dean serves as the chairman on the authority. He has served on the board for 15 years. And I think that he would make a, uh, uh, a very... Um, able, qualified representative from Mill Creek Township on the Erie City Water Authority, obviously very knowledgeable about the Mill Creek system, and I think that that would be extremely beneficial for the Erie City Water Authority now that they own the um, Mill Creek system. Okay. Mr. Morgan, you have a name. Uh, I would nominate Russ Thompson. Uh, Mr. Thompson is a local uh, Mill Creek businessman who's been very involved in, this, in the Water Authority issue over the past few years. Uh, he actually took it upon himself to have independent research on the issue. Uh, as part of a local advocacy group. I think he's uh, a very bright man. I think he's very knowledgeable, and I think he represents us very well on the board. I think he'd also be uh, a very uh, strong watchdog for our community on that board. Okay. And myself, I'd like to nominate uh, Mr. Lou Arcovio. Lou Arcovio. That is, he uh, lives on Vista Drive. I think it's the 4,000 block. Uh, he's an elderly gentleman who's been very much involved with the Cleaner, Cheaper Water Group uh, here in Mill Creek. And uh, I'd like to see his appointment to that, too. So there are three names there. Cheryl, you have all the names. I'll give you Lou uh, Arcovio's complete address when I get upstairs there. But uh, those are the names. Uh, do we have to vote on that, do you think? Or? I think why not make it okay. a resolution? We'll make it a resolution. Just, you know, no numbering on it uh, there. I would move that Lou Arcovio, Dean Swanson, and I'm sorry, Thompson. Russ Thompson, Russ Thompson, Thompson. Um, be submitted as our candidates. Okay. Uh, to fill the two vacancies on the Erie City Water Authority. Okay. Do I hear a second on that? I'll second that. Thank you. Okay, Mr. McGrath. Yes. Mr. Morgan. I vote yes. And I vote yes. Thank you. Okay. Let's see here. Number 13, nomination of additional fund depositories for 2016. Mark, back to you again. Okay. <laughs> we had uh, two corporate... Uh, entities uh, submit their real estate taxes for 2016 under protest. Under the uh, laws of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, those funds need to be segregated in a separate account. So I'm proposing that we open uh, a separate account for each of the corporate entities at Erie Bank uh, until such time as the uh, court orders us to, uh, uh, allows us to uh, either pay them back or to uh, uh, take the monies into uh, our general fund. Okay, and those two accounts are listed as, uh, that's for one for uh, LECOM? One for LECOM and the other for Wegmans. Right, and these are the, the accounts that we're putting money into then, okay. And, and it's really 25% of the payment, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, do I uh, hear a motion to I'll move approval? Do I hear a second on that? <coughs> I'll second. Okay, Mr. McGrath, on your vote? Yes. Mr. Morgan? I vote yes. And I vote yes. Communications. Just 
start uh, with Mark. Down to you again there, Mark. You're in the hot seat. Okay. Uh, last meeting we approved the uh, uh, attendance at PSATs, but there was a, uh, a uh, one, uh, there was a request for more information as to the cost involved. Okay. Uh, and last year we spent just under $5,000 for the attendees at the conference. This year it's going to be a little bit more. It's going to be closer to $5,600. And the biggest portion of that change is due to uh, room costs. There was a different configuration where not everybody stayed at the same uh, uh, location last year. Mm -hmm. And plus the room rates themselves went up over the year over year. Okay. So the request would be to uh, approve this expenditure of $5,600. Okay. You okay with those numbers there, John? The numbers that we're getting? Um, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm seeing 3995 Is there another? It doesn't it? include the meals and mileage. Oh, well, that's okay. right. Yeah, it doesn't have the meals and mileage. Oh, it was an estimated. Mm -hmm. Okay. These are estimated. Although I can assure the public, what we spend on meals is next to nothing down there. Yeah. Yep, it's true. Well, the Erie County Association of Township Officials has a hospitality suite that they feed lunch to everybody right. mm -hmm. every day, and it's, and it's a good lunch, okay. and uh, saves the township some money. Okay. What was the total cost again, Mark? About $5,600 is what I'm estimating. All right. Well, I, would, I would move to approve an expense not to exceed $600. I'll, I'll second that. Okay. Mr. M Mr. Morgan, how do you vote? I vote yes. Mr. McGrath? Yes. And I vote yes. Next item, administrative, administrative training request from the payroll manager tabled from last week, or last meeting that is. Um, let's see here, who had this one? Mark. 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 Okay. Uh, there was a request for additional information with regard to uh, um, notary training. Uh, <coughs> The, we investigated, uh, well, PAN is a, 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 a or is a Pennsylvania Association of Notaries. They uh, do on-site training, not, uh, they do training in Erie uh, at a, a seminar setting, as opposed to online. Uh, there's a small difference in the price between the two, but in discussion with our existing notaries, they felt it was very beneficial to actually attend with other notaries because uh, situations come up that uh, they may not may or may not confront and therefore they get input not only from the class but also from other notaries so I am recommending that uh, we allow uh, Janice Riker to attend the PAN uh, registration class at uh, in Erie on May the 11th I believe it is okay I hear a motion for that request I'll move approval Okay, do I hear a second? I'll second. Okay, Mr. Morgan, how do you vote? I vote yes. Mr. McGrath? Yes. I vote yes. Okay, um, spring season staff approval, Parks and Rec. Uh, one, uh, one employee uh, submitted by Ashley Marsteller for Matthew Zabot, a part-time uh, maintenance employee at $8.45, and I'll move approval of that. Okay, I hear a second on that. Is that a new position, Brian, or is that filling a previously budgeted position? That's filling a, well, it, it's part-time. It'd be for the, it'd be for the, uh, for the summer. Oh, actually spring, it says. Um, part-time maintenance for spring. We don't typically have part-time maintenance for spring, although Ashley would not have submitted that if it wasn't in her budget. She's very particular about that. So I don't know if you can shed any light on that, Mark, but I think that uh, uh, if she had a part-time maintenance person in um, in her budget, it would have uh, obviously been, been uh, a line item. We don't usually have a part-time maintenance person? Not, not in the spring. In the summer, we have a lot. Um, this, must, this person must be coming on uh, early uh, to do part-time maintenance. And again, Ashley would not have submitted this unless, unless it was in her budget. Okay. So I would move approval of that. I'll second that motion. Mr. McGrath? Yes. How do you vote? Yes. Mr. Morgan, how do you vote? I vote yes. And I vote yes. 
And the only other thing that I have is from Diane Lyons, uh, our uh, Human Resources Director. Uh, she would like to have the board uh, approve the hiring of Brent Salhoff uh, as a mechanic at $17.99 per hour. Brent, Brent is currently employed with Yardmaster as an inspection mechanic for vehicles, diesel trucks, and equipment. He's been a diesel mechanic for approximately 18 years and also has experience from Concrete Services Corporation. He received formal diesel training at Crawford County Votech. He has a Class B CDL and his Class 7 inspection license. Um, this employment officer's offer, offer is contingent upon successful completion of our pre-employment screening, but uh, we just received word, I believe yesterday, that uh, Brent has uh, passed all of his pre-employment screening, and so I would move approval of the hiring of Brent M. Salhoff as our new mechanic in the garage. Well, I hear a second on that. I'll second. Okay, Mr. McGrath, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Morgan. I vote yes. And I vote yes. That's all I have. Okay, I've got several here from the Milk Creek Police Department, from Director of Police Mike Tesor. Uh, let's see here, I'll start off with the first one. Permission to, for bomb technician Ryan Mays to attend the homemade explosives training with the Pittsburgh ATF on May 19th and 20th in Pittsburgh. This class will focus on the interoperability among different police bomb squads and update trainees on current trends with homemade explosives. There is no registration fee or anticipated overtime. However, hotel and, hotel and meal expenses are projected to be around $400. So I make that in the form of a motion. I'll second. Okay, Mr. Morgan, how do you vote? I vote yes. Mr. McGrath? Yes. And I vote yes. Item number two is permission for Sergeant Leslie Mitchell and TAC Officer Cheryl Comstock and Assistant TAC Officer Tim Stevenson to attend mandatory TAC upda update training at the FBI Auditorium Building in Monroeville, Pennsylvania on April 18th. This class will cover administrative regulations, new rules, validation processes, and audits as they pertain to the use of our CLEAN system. That's the acronym, uh, I can't remember what it was, but CLEAN is an acronym. Uh, in the MPD Dispatch Center, there is no registration fee for this training. However, it will require approximately two hours and overtime compensation for the travel time. I make that in the form of a motion. Mr. Chairman, what, what does tax stand for again? For the public's uh, benefit? Is it? Um, no, my mind's drawing. If they're back See, there. now we have an officer here that could explain Tim. what tax. Tim. <laughs> there you go. Tim, yeah, terminal agency uh, coordinator. Yeah. Okay. My mind just, I'm sorry. No problem. I'll second the motion. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Morgan, how do you vote? I vote yes. Mr. McGrath? Yes. And I vote yes. Item number three, permission for Lieutenant Mike Little, Sergeant Chris Haber, Corporal Scott Leone, Corporal Wayne Forcier, Corporal Robert Bucko, and Patrolman Chris Gotham to attend a firearms instructor recertification course at Mercyhurst Northeast Municipal Training Academy on April 18th and 19th. This class or any other equivalent is required every three years in order for all firearms instructors to maintain their certifications. Registration fees total $1,000, and there are no additional costs associated with this training. I make that in the form of a motion. I'll second. Okay, Mr. McGrath, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Morgan. I vote yes. And I vote yes. Item number four, is permission to hire one part-time animal officer, animal enforcement officer, to work approximately an average of 20 hours per week. Uh, Mike Tesor proposes this individual to be paid $16 per hour during a three-month training period with the wage being increased to $18 per hour upon successful completion of the training period. As for the pay for requested, he feels it justifiable as the animal enforcement officer is required to carry a weapon and sometimes need to fire the weapon and faces regular dangers with wild or dangerous animals and is tasked with enforcing various ordinances and laws. This hire would provide the township with animal enforcement coverage seven days per week while also providing additional coverage on weekends or on high volume days. Furthermore, he or she would serve as a temporary replacement to the full-time uh, animal enforcement officer in the event of injury, vacation, or sickness. Uh, lastly, the full-time AEO animal enforcement officer also serves as our TAC officer, assistant TAC officer in the police department uh, and would replace uh, that uh, animal officer in that situation. Thus, uh, Mike believes that uh, the cost of the part-time officer would aid the township in many ways at a reasonable hourly request, at a re reasonable hourly cost while main minimali minimizing overtime compensation currently paid to the full-time animal officer. 
So with that, I make that motion to hire an AMLA officer uh, 20 hours a week, uh, starting at $16 an hour. I'll second that. We don't have the name yet, but we uh, hopefully get that name out there soon. You have a second on that? Mr. McGrath, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Morgan, how do you vote? Well, Mr. Chair, I appreciate a chance to discuss this for a moment. Um, and, and I don't mean for this to be critical specifically of our police department, um, but this request to me, um, I understand um, the perceived need for this position from our director of police's position. However, what, what I don't see in this request, I, I don't see anything regarding any kind of budget analysis to, to, to determine where the funds for this position are coming from. We don't have a total annual cost for this position. I'm not sure why this position wasn't requested in the 2016 budget. Um, I don't see any kind of financial analysis for that. I, I also don't see any kind of a, objective, measurable justification for it. I, I would assume the police department tracks cases, they track response time, and they track response rates to justify the need for an additional officer. I, I, I don't see that here in this request. Um, I also uh, don't see how they're anticipating a decrease in overtime. There's no calculation of that. Um, I also don't see how or what other alternatives were considered besides hiring a part-time position. I, again, I, I, don't, I, I believe we should have these kinds of standards for, for any new position that is going to be added outside of our regular budgeting process. So I'm, I'm not, I don't mean to be critical specifically of the police department. I'm more critical of us as a board um, and how we uh, receive requests for new positions and how we make that determination. Um, so that, that, that's the concern I have about this particular request. I, I'll have to agree with you on, on one thing, John. If it were any other department, I think that we probably would have more specifics, and it typically would not happen, I don't want to say mid-year, but early, even early in the year. Um, we would have some kind of justification, and it would be a budget item. Um, I don't know whether um, Director Tesor suddenly found the need for this or um, if uh, the volume of complaints has suddenly uh, required this, but um, I think you're looking at a, at about a between a fifteen and eighteen thousand dollar annual expenditure it would be something less than that since we're going to be doing this mid year, um, and that's something that if, if Director Tesor finds that a necessary hiring, then he's going to have to justify that somewhere else in his budget. Um, going to have to come up with the money someplace. I agree, and I, I just think this board should have that information before we make determinations on these kinds of issues. Um, I don't know how critical, John, your liaison, is this yeah. critical that this be done today, or could this wait until next Tuesday? We do have a meeting again next week. Yes, we do have a meeting. Um, I know we ha I have made the motion. You made the second on that. Um, Maybe uh, a further discussion may, with uh, Mike Tesor may be warranted. Uh, what I can say, at least in the interim right now, is that animal complaints can happen 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Our animal officer works 40 hours a week. Um, he can be called in for overtime, you know, and I believe it's a, uh, two hours at double time, I think. I don't know the contract. Please don't quote me to that there, but uh, there's a cost right there. Um, and uh, quite frankly, you know, especially if it's a stray dog, I'm not talking a vicious dog, uh, the process, the animal has to be taken to the Humane Society. We don't store the dog here. Um, also, the fact if there is a, you know, I know there might be a belief that the officers, the police officers out on patrol can handle this. I think it's only in a case of a vicious dog, and unfortunately we've had that happen a couple times where our, um, uh, our officers out in the field have had to expedite uh, you know, an animal for one reason or another. And uh, it's sad to say that, but uh, if we have a situation where an animal officer can uh, handle the situation, especially if it's just a, a wandering dog or something like that, um, I think you know, rather than call an animal officer in for, uh, for overtime, you know, that's just my belief on it. But uh, as requested, uh, if you need further information, we can talk about it. Uh, maybe get Mike to soar in and have I, I would imagine that you mentioned the overtime. I would imagine that that fifteen to eighteen thousand dollar number that I came up with may be something less than that when you consider the fact that this could actually be saving on 
overtime. Yeah. Uh, and, and gentlemen, I, I, again, I, I'm not suggesting that um, this isn't reasonable, but I think from a procedural perspective, we, we should be requesting a little more information from our department heads before approving these kinds of uh, additions to our workforce. All right, then with that, I would amend my motion. Well, we already have a motion. Oh, we have a motion. We actually took a vote. No, we didn't vote. Cheryl, did we vote on that yet? No, we have a motion and a second. Mr. Um, I moved. You moved. So you would have to amend it. I think we might actually just vote down and then have, and then, you know. I, I'm, I'm poised to go through with this here. Um, you know, I'm going to vote yes. To? Ryan. As, as the motion is on the floor. To approve it as it is? And to approve as it is. Um, oh, well, this is kind of, this is very similar to, uh, to uh, Ashley's uh, request that uh, I would hope that our department heads have enough on the ball that they're going to only request something if they can afford it. And I'd like to just get this over with also. So I would, uh, you're going to vote yes, I'll vote yes. Okay. okay, Mr. Morgan, how do you vote? I would just note that from the information you provided, Ashley's request is part of her budget, so I think it's different. Um, I'm going to vote no. True. Okay. Okay. Okay, the vote's two to one. Okay, thank you. Okay, and I believe I have one more action. Uh, let's see here. Oh, this, okay, this is um, item number five from uh, Mike Tesor, Director of Police. Uh, permission to accept the resignation of Joe's Hilltop Garage and Towing of Henderson Road as a towing contractor uh, for Mill Creek Township, retroactive to yesterday, April 4th. Uh, the owner, Mr. Joe Kuyava, has submitted his res resignation in writing in order to pursue other business interests. Uh, the vacancy now is with the East End Zone of Mill Creek Township, and Mike is recommending Rick Sorenberger, uh, Automotive uh, 2616 West 21st, uh, be awarded these duties retroactive to yesterday. The owner, Rick Sorenberger, hold, currently holds a towing contract with the township and has performed well under this contract and it has submitted a, a letter of interest for this assignment. Uh, so that's uh, one thing that Mike is asking about. You have copies of the resignation from, uh, from Joe? Is that in there? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, the, in other words, uh, Mr. Kiava is retiring from his towing business and uh, Mike Tesor is recommending that Rick Sorenberger Automotive fill in that area that zone of Mill Creek Township as the authorized towing company. So I make that in the form of a motion to accept that, uh, that not only the resignation, but the, the assignment uh, to Rick Sornberg. I'll second that. Okay. Mr. McGrath, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Morgan, how do you vote? I vote yes. And I vote yes. Mr. Sure, I think we should clarify that this was Mr. Kiawa's decision. The board did not request this from Mr. Kiawa. He, he, no, no, I, I, I understand that uh, he's decided to pursue other business interests. And I think it's probably more primarily around the garage. Right. Keep in mind, I, I don't, I, you know, of course, I haven't talked with him, but I'm assuming that garage work you know, takes up a lot of work. And then when mm -hmm. you take away from t over to towing, you know, you're taking away from your real meat and potatoes where the, where the repair work is at. So, and, uh, and Mr. Yeah. Gow was kind enough to recommend Mr. Stormberger as well. His I believe so. Yes. Well, and they had been on a part of it, too. Because I was actually involved in this. Yeah. It was Mr. Kiava's decision. Yeah. Uh, basically, this board has approved contracts with towers that included a description of their responsibility areas. Yeah. So this affects one contract mm -hmm. and it affects the definition of Mr. Sornberger's area. So it was my recommendation that it be brought to the board because this effectively modifies Mr. Ford Sornberger's contract. Yes. That's the point. Okay. Okay. And then I got just two brief uh, matters here too. Um, one is that next year, 2017, the bridge over Walnut Creek on Grub Road is scheduled for a replacement. Uh, the company that's doing that work was kind enough to send us a document and uh, uh, somewhat of a plan. Of, it's actually of a detour route. It is on display out in the lobby out there. It's sitting on that table over by Carol's desk, uh, or by the receptionist's desk, that is. Uh, it shows the area proposed for, uh, you know, for detour on that there. So I uh, want people to know about that. It is coming up uh, next year. I'm not sure the, the starting date on that there. Rick, you don't know. It's probably going to be in the spring of next year, but that bridge will be replaced, and it will have an impact on travel uh, heading south and north on Grub Road. The other thing is that um, our meeting schedule here for this month in, uh, in April has been modified. Uh, we have our meeting this morning, of course. Our next meeting is Tuesday, April the 12th. 
and it's had a seven o'clock meeting. Normally that meeting would be held the, uh, the fourth Tuesday of the month, which is April 26, which is primary day. This building is used for the primary, for the election. So we will not have a meeting that day. So please keep in mind, the meeting is the 12th, next Tuesday, 7 p.m. here in uh, Chambers here. That's all I have, thank you. John, anything? Uh, well, I have a, a, a request for the board. Um, the Erie Area Council of Governments uh, is offering a training seminar for zoning hearing board members throughout the county as well as zoning hearing board staff support and solicitors. Uh, I've reached out to our board and, and all three members plus our alternate uh, would like to attend the training. I, I'd also recommend that we, we send our zoning administrator and assistant zoning administrator to that training. Uh, the total cost for members of the COG is $10 per person. So I would uh, make a motion that the board approve uh, the expense of $60 to make six reservations uh, for this training session to be held April 20th from 5 to 8.30 p.m. at the Summit Township Municipal Building to cover the costs of our, our volunteers, our hearing board members, and our staff to attend. Okay, do I hear a second on that? I'll second that. Okay, Mr. Morgan, how do you vote? I vote yes. Mr. McGrath? <clears throat> yes. And I vote yes. Uh, and the only thing I'd like to, to add, Mr. Chairman, uh, for the discussion today is uh, we, last week, we also had a training seminar for our planning commission. Uh, the Erie County Department of Planning uh, was kind enough to arrange to have a guest speaker come up uh, from the Pennsylvania Department of Community Economic Development to discuss uh, current best practices for municipal comprehensive plans. Uh, I really appreciated all of our planning commissioners uh, made, uh, made the effort to attend. I think it was a good meeting. Uh, it was a good start to this process that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we'll be having some follow-up meetings with our commission and our staff to determine uh, how to move forward with the plan, but it's looking good. And you know, hopefully we'll be, we'll get this thing kicked off for, for a public kickoff sometime this summer. Okay. And John, on to that effect, I'd, I'd like to also comment that I was uh, impressed by the fact that all seven planning commission members and our alternate came to the, I don't know, it didn't last I don't know, a couple hours maybe? Yeah, two but, hours, yeah. Um, it was two hours in the middle of the day that uh, these volunteers took to, to show up and showed uh, interest in, in uh, the process. And uh, I want to thank them for, for doing so. Yep. Okay. And we'll be, I, I want to assure everybody that it was, this was a uh, more of a training for our commissioners to prepare them for the process. We haven't started updating the comprehensive plan yet. Uh, when we do start that process, we're going to have a very, uh, very public, very thorough conversation with, with our community about what that plan is going to entail. And uh, right now we're just kind of in the preliminary stages of figuring out how best to accomplish that. Okay. Okay. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. Evan, anything? I don't have anything. Okay, Cheryl, you have a right to know report. I have the right to know report for March. In March, we received six right to know requests. Two, we uh, requested extensions, 30 day extensions due to the volume of the requests. The other four have been completed. Uh, one was a partial denial, one was a denial, and two were granted. Um, there was no cost to the township because these were all uh, received by email and the requests were able to be emailed back to the requesters. Okay. Total no, cost no cost as far as materials go, but there was 17 and a half hours roughly yeah. in labor. Yes, there were yes. 17 and a half hours spent on these. Yes, yes. thank you. Okay. Rick, Rick Morris, anything? Chuck, anything from your department? Citizens will be heard. We have any citizens will be heard? Being none, we'll adjourn the meeting at 1026. So move. Okay. We're out of here. Thank you. You're watching the Mill Creek Government Channel, powered by WQLN Public Media.